community. He lives at home with his wife. Um, and he has kind of a fairly uh, typical medical history for someone who's living well into their 80s with some diabetes and blood pressure. Uh, and he has a pacemaker in uh, for some of his heart disease. But overall, pretty active, um, energetic part of the community. You would see him at the masjid and other places uh, interacting with people. Now, over the last five years or so, he started to have some memory loss, okay? He started to get forgetful about five years ago. It was made clear to him that he may have early signs of dementia. And he told his wife and his family very clearly that, you know, things progress along. I don't want to have life extending treatment. Okay, so this was one of the things he said. He didn't write anything down or go into detail, but it's something that he made clear. And uh, those who, who knew him well and loved him understood that that was kind of part of his overall goals. And over these five years, as his condition has progressed, his ability to do things independently has gone down a little bit, and he's requiring more and more support for some of his day to day activities. His wife, at the same time, is starting to have some difficulty with some of the care. So she's having to do more and more, and she's also in her 80s herself, and it's getting challenging, but this is just kind of in the background. So a scenario that many of you may be familiar with through people you know, maybe your own lives, or, or people in the community. And if not, then it's something we can, um, it can happen, right? So uh, now, one day, Ibrahim wakes up in the morning, and he's very confused. He's not like his normal self, and his wife is concerned. Uh, so she puts a blood pressure monitor on at home that they have, and she notes that it's really, really low. It's about 80 over 50, which is very low for him. Um, she's, of course, worried and does what most of us would do. She calls 911. He's brought straight to the hospital. Um, she's, she's in there with him, and kind of even before anything gets started, they get some fluids in through an IV, get some antibiotics going, uh, and then some of these conversations start. So the medical team tells her that, okay, he's going to need to stay in hospital for a few days at least. Uh, we think he may have an infection. He may have uh, pneumonia. Uh, we have him on these antibiotics. And she thinks back, she knows what he did want in terms of his life and also some of the things that he's expressed over the years uh, in passing about what he did not want. And one of the things I mentioned before was that he said he did not want life extending treatment. And so she mentions this to the uh, medical doctor who's, who's doing his initial admission work and asking her questions. And she asks, you know, what do you think I should do? Because he said he doesn't want life extending. Is this kind of in that area? Is it something else? And she asks that question. So we'll, we'll pause with Ibrahim for a second and we'll talk a bit about uh, advanced care planning in general, okay? Um, and again, so I don't see uh, anyone there, but I'm going to assume everyone's hearing me okay, and if not, maybe uh, uh, the organizers can unmute and, and just let me know. But advanced care planning uh, is a broad concept that has mostly to do with making decisions for what you would want in the future in terms of your care, okay? So in advanced care planning, the person deciding is yourself. Okay, so for myself, I would say, you know, if this happened to me in the future, I would want this, I would not want this like that. It is not uh, someone else deciding for me or providing advice for me. That's a different category that we'll talk a little bit about as well. So it's your, the patient or the person who's making the decision. And sometimes that person's not able to. So for example, in Ibrahim's case, he's here in the emergency department. Uh, as I said before, he alluded to some things he didn't want, but now he's not in a state to answer for a couple of reasons. One, his thinking, memory, and, and all of that has declined over the years, and he may not fully understand the intricacies of the discussion now. But also, number two, he's very sick right now, right? So his blood pressure is low. He's got what they think might be a pneumonia. He's not thinking as clearly as he would normally anyway. So the way the medical system works, and again, I know we have uh, at least one visitor from out of country, so this is Canada specific, but most of the principles are uh, the same in most countries. But we have a system of what's called substitute decision makers. So when you're there in the emergency department and your uh, spouse, let's say, is, is ill, uh, usually what the medical team will do is they'll look at the person beside the bed and they'll ask them, what do you want us to do? What should be done is we should 
look at so properly what the medical team should be doing and, and many of the clinical doctors, nurse practitioners and others will do this the right way is they will say, ask a couple questions. So they'll say, does Ibrahim have a power of attorney? Okay, a power of attorney is someone that you can designate as making your decisions for you if you can't make them yourself. Okay, and we'll talk about just a power of attorney for healthcare for now. There's other types for finances and things too. But uh, maybe Ibrahim had said a few years ago or at some point when he was clear-minded and stuff that if I can't make decisions, uh, I know it will be really stressful for my wife, so I don't want her to do it. I'm going to ask my daughter to make those decisions or my son or my grandson or my best friend or someone like that. This is valid if it's in writing. Okay, If he just said that and it was his word, it would not be valid unless uh, the people kind of on this hierarchy, you went through them and they said, no, we all think it should be the best friend. So the way it works is step one, power of attorney. That would be someone written on paper with a lawyer, have signed it and said that when I can't make decisions, I want my best friend to make them for me. If you don't have that, and most of us probably do not have that, and most people I see uh, clinically do not have that, then we go down this stepwise process. So the highest rank is a spouse or a common law or a partner. So uh, that would be rank number one or number two here if we take out the power of attorney. If the spouse is not around, they've passed away or they're unavailable because they're somewhere inaccessible or they say, I don't want to make these decisions, then it goes to the next person. And that would be the children or the parents. So you can imagine for someone who might be in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they may have living children and parents, uh, adult children, I mean, 18 plus and parents. So it actually has to be a uh, joint decision between everyone in that category. So if you have seven children and your spouse is not around or is not willing to make the decision, all seven children need to agree on the next steps. Okay. And we can get into some of this later if there's questions related. And then you keep going down. Siblings, if there's no children or parents, any other relative. Okay, so now we get into cousins, aunts, uncles, and there's a bit of a process to try to figure out who's the closest and most likely. And then the last resort, which we ideally don't want to have happen, is that it goes through a government channel called the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee, where if there's nobody available, or let's say, again, we have seven children and they cannot decide. There's four on one side, three on the other, and they're just there's no decision being made then sometimes it goes to the public guardian and trustee. So that's the official process here in Ontario and across most of Canada. And many uh, Western countries have a similar process to this. Okay. So jump back to Ibrahim. So Ibrahim was there in the eMERGE. His wife said to the doctor, you know, he said he doesn't want to extend life. What should we do? The doctor said, you know, it's just, uh, they're also in a rush, as you can imagine. Maybe it's nighttime. Maybe they have other things going on, other sick people to attend to. And they say, you know, the antibiotics are fairly safe. Let's give it a try for a few days, uh, and then we can readdress this. And that's a very common approach because um, sometimes decisions need to be made quickly, and it's uh, easier and sometimes safer to err on the side of let's treat the person and then decide later if we want to back off, as opposed to going the other way around when sometimes we don't treat, they can get very sick. But he gets better. The pneumonia is better. His breathing is better. But now he's getting a little bit weaker, having trouble swallowing. Uh, and remember, he's declined over the last several years. So he's having trouble swallowing and falling behind on his nutrition. It's been five, six, seven days in hospital now. He's not eating very much. And so they ask uh, again to his wife, um, should we put in a feeding tube? So that's a, that's a tough one. That's one that she's never really thought about. And I think probably most of us here have not thought about. So let's let's go to general Islamic principles um, around uh, ethical issues, but also specifically around uh, feeding tubes and, and this sort of thing. So there's a lot of complexities, a lot of different areas, and you will almost certainly get different opinions from different even scholars, experts, doctors, but there's a few basic principles um, that, that we would generally go by. And then I'll give you kind of my thoughts. And again, I encourage you if you're having these sorts of conversation discussions, look at your uh, alim, your leader. I know uh, many people here are affiliated with, with uh, Jaffrey Center. Mulana Rizvi has, has uh, written and spoken about these topics before as well. So the number one principle in 
almost all of Islamic ethics is that life in and of itself has value. So we call that kind of the sanctity of life. So life by itself, irrespective of, you know, quality of life or uh, other things like that, life is valuable. So that's a guiding principle from the start. But there's a few exceptions. If we're doing something that's causing clear suffering, if we're doing something that's shortening the life, obviously. And then there's this tricky one, if we're doing something that's actually not prolonging life necessarily, but it's prolonging the dying process, then we don't always have to do it. So that's a, a gray area, obviously, with lots of um, different potential views. But if we're doing something where we understand someone is in the dying process and there's a therapy available to extend that dying process, it is not required to do. Okay. Uh, most other things that would prolong life would be encouraged from an Islamic perspective. Relating to nutrition and hydration, it's a difficult question there. Are we delaying death in some situations or are we prolonging life? And it's a very individual decision based on the circumstances and the underlying condition and that there's a lot of nuance to it so it's hard to put a blanket statement on this but we know that there are some negatives to feeding tubes okay a feeding tubes sorry just to be clear i'll take a step back um, temporarily if someone's very sick in hospital they will often put a feeding tube in through the nose that goes directly into the stomach and then you get liquid nutrition put in through there to try to provide some calories and nutrition to the person and then there's a more permanent option where there's a minor surgical procedure and it's put in through the stomach. Uh, and then it stays there long-term, sometimes for life and sometimes for a longer time. The one through the nose usually is a, at most a couple of weeks. So there's some negatives to feeding tubes, okay? And you can get too much fluid in the body. You can feel nauseous sometimes. The quality of life um, depends kind of who's, who's helping to define this quality of life. Is it up to the doctors and nurses who may have very different views than you? Is it up to the spouse? Is it the children? Ideally, it should be the person whose life we're talking about, uh, but obviously usually they're not in a state to, to have these conversations at the time. There's a few um, Quranic verses and, and reference points that we can, we can look at to try to help us understand. Uh, so there's uh, ayah in the Quran that speak about food being from Allah about feelings of hunger may perhaps being a test and the importance of food for those who are hungry. And so many people uh, with a religious and particularly Islamic perspective would say, it's not a medical treatment, it's a basic human need, okay? So getting back to Ibrahim. So his wife has some of these things maybe going in her mind and uh, she talks to her kids and the family's feeling some pressure from the team and the staff doctor and other people and they seem to want a decision soon. And the way they're wording things makes you feel like maybe they don't think a feeding tube is a good idea. They sometimes will say very clearly that it's not indicated because there are some situations where it's not uh, medically indicated to do a procedure. This Maybe this is one. But most of the time, they will tell you, okay, we can do it. This is what it would look like. It'd have the tube in for a couple of weeks. If it gets better, great. If it doesn't, we might need a permanent one. Um, or we can not do it and see how he does the next few days. Usually they will give you options. The family sits down with the medical team. Uh, family asks very uh, important questions that we don't want him to starve. They understand that he probably would not have wanted a feeding tube, but they also don't want to be responsible for playing an active part in ending his life. So we're often very torn. And, and one thing I very often uh, hear families say or express is that uh, they would rather not have had an option in that situation. They would rather not be the ones to have to make that decision. They would prefer, you know, let some expert in the area who can tell the pros and cons make it. Now, the problem is those people don't often have your cultural or religious or other context, so that can make it a little bit tricky. They may have different values than you do, uh, but this often does come up. So on the notion of advanced care planning, everybody should have it. Everybody, especially if you have some medical conditions, um, you can talk to your family doctor. You, if you want to put in writing, usually you need to go through a legal process to have documents written up. Um, what should we be discussing? Okay, so we should be discussing specific goals of care. Uh, what do I want? What do I not want? You will never write every single nuance, every single scenario, but you will be able to talk in broad strokes. That for me, um, extending life no matter what is important or no for me if I can do a b and c I think that would be good quality of life and it's different for everybody 
Okay, we have a lot of people on the call today. A lot of people have different views on this. When do you want to have these conversations? Ideally not when someone is sick in a hospital and there's a time sensitive decision being made. It's better to make when you're well, okay? You're well, you have some time to sit and think and say, okay, this is what I do or do not want. This is how I, I do or don't see kind of my end days potentially living out. Um, and you wanna do it at a time when there's less emotional distress and less things playing in there. It's best to do it in a stable setting, right? Not in the emergency department when someone's being admitted to a hospital and there's noise and they're in a rush and the doctor's pressuring you and you've never really thought about this before. That's not the ideal place. Okay, so everybody's here and Shala is safe and comfortable in their homes. And this is the type of time where maybe we start exploring these ideas a little bit. Why do we do it? Okay, so why do we want to have advanced care planning? It's so that you can make the right decision for yourself because your view on things might be different than your husband or your wife. It might be different than your children. It might be different than other people, but you want to be able to do that. And then also you want to ideally take the pressure away from your family and other people. Instead of uh, the wife, Ibrahim's wife at the bedside having to make this decision, if Ibrahim had said very clearly, I do or don't want this, it would have uh, taken a lot of that burden away. The how to do it is difficult. It takes time, takes some exploration. Uh, it'll take some conversations, hopefully with your doctor. So it's not the visit where you have three other problems going on. You know, your chest has been hurting for a while. You have swelling in your leg and this and that. It's a dedicated visit where you just want to focus on this. So that gives your doctor the time to focus on it and answer questions properly. And it gives you the time to focus on it as well. Okay. A common one that we get. So if you're ever with a loved one in the emergency department, one thing that they will almost always ask, especially if you end up having to stay in hospital, is around something called code status. Okay, Code status means, uh, do we want to do uh, CPR, go to an ICU, things like that. A common way that I've seen it asked, which I don't think is the best way to ask it, uh, but I've heard it directly and, and I know people ask it sometimes this way is, uh, let's say the daughter is there, do you want us to do everything to keep your dad alive? Okay. It's very hard to say no to that. Uh, and most people will say, okay, yeah, that seems to make sense. Why wouldn't I? Um, unless you have very clear advanced directives that, oh, no, dad had said he does not want uh, to have CPR ever or go to an ICU or this or that. There are more nuanced ways, but you can see the difference. There's a one-line way of asking that's quick, easy. You'll get a quick answer. And then there's a longer way. And for the busy uh, doctor, nurse practitioner, whoever it is in the hospital, it's often the short one-line way that they ask proper way to ask this sort of thing is if your father's heart stopped naturally, it means it passed away. Would he have wanted aggressive measures to restart his heart like CPR, chest compressions, electric shocks, breathing tubes, knowing that he'll have to go to the ICU after and we will likely have to break some ribs to keep the heart beating if we went that way. It gives people a bit of an idea of what this actually means, what you're actually asking. Um, it is very uncommon for most doctors and other people to ask it in this way, but um, as the family, the recipient, the person on the other end, this is often what they're trying to get at, okay? We care a lot about what the person wants, okay? But um, as the family member at the bedside, you are often going to be in that position where you have to decide. And it's good to have an idea of the risks and benefits, okay? Often it's fairly clear. Somebody has very advanced cancer, they have very low functional status, they can't do very much. It might be very clear that, okay, the chances of good survival are, are not, not very high, but most of the time it's not that clear cut. And so we want to have some ways of, of trying to look at, okay, how do we clarify this? Uh, sometimes the medical team will use words like uh, meaningful life. You know, are there chances of meaningful quality of life? Um, is that meaningful from the clinician's perspective who maybe doesn't have your cultural and religious context? Uh, sometimes they'll use words like uh, any further care is futile, meaning it has no benefit. But again, these words, we, we generally want to uh, remove ourselves from the specific terms and try to look at the overall uh, questions that are being asked and focus on what is most important in our end. 
there are some tools, just so you're aware. This is not something I expect anyone to go on and, and try to access, but there are some tools out there uh, like this one. And I'm, I'll share my slides after with the uh, organizers. And I guess this will be on YouTube as well, where you can put in different things like age and medical conditions and come out with a likelihood of good neurologic or brain function survival after CPR. Okay, if you had a, your heart stopped totally. And you can see that little things like this. So this one is 0.9%. And if I just changed a couple of factors, if I said that person was not in a nursing home and did not have dementia, it goes from 0.9% to 10 times higher, over 9%. So there's a lot of different, you know, you can play around with things that you can put in ages and other things. You can even try it for yourself just to have a, an idea. Inshallah, none of us are ever in that situation uh, where, where this is relevant, but there are some tools out there that can help uh, people make a more informed decision. Common question uh, that is often asked is, can a Muslim be DNR? So the general answer is yes, but there are some different views. So again, that's where you want to speak to your alim or expert in the area. Um, so generally, DNR means do not resuscitate. It means if my heart stopped totally, I died a natural death, is it mandatory for people to do CPR, electric shocks, breathing tubes, and revive me? Most scholars will say, no, it's not mandatory for you to say yes to that. Um, but uh, if you have a reversible condition and uh, a reasonable likelihood of survival, then likely you should go ahead with that sort of care. Separate question is, well, once somebody's on life-sustaining care, once they maybe, let's say they're in an ICU on a breathing tube, can we remove it? The differing views here. So the majority of Muslims, mainly uh, Sunni Muslims, will say, yes, you, you can remove care. Uh, majority of Shia, but not all, will say, no, you cannot remove care. Um, so again, that's, a, that's one where you would want to speak to your scholar to get a clear answer on that. But what I'm saying there is, if somebody was already on a therapy that's keeping them alive, can we take that therapy off? Okay, that's the point I was making. There's a difference between withholding care, okay? That means not doing the CPR in the first place and withdrawing it, meaning taking off the, the therapy. And technically, for any clinical um, person to take off a therapy, meaning let's say turn off the ventilator is a common one people will hear, they need consent and agreement from family. That's general terms. Keep in mind these days with um, COVID and the numbers, a lot of these general rules are uh, being put aside in the, in the interest of kind of larger, uh, bigger picture things, but generally that's the way things are. And I'm happy to get into that if anyone has more questions later. So let's talk about, we'll switch gears a bit. And the next couple of sections are a bit shorter. I know where we have a schedule. Let's talk a bit about palliative care. Palliative care basically means we wanna focus on comfort, safety, quality of life, okay? So it's less on living longer and more on living a better quality of life overall. Okay, meaning less pain, maybe less anxiety, maybe less breathing trouble, this sort of thing. Generally speaking, palliative care is uh, completely acceptable. Okay, so people are allowed to, at the end stages of their life, not pursue active care if it's clear that they have a condition that's um, irreversible and very advanced. Let's say it's advanced uh, pancreatic cancer, for example, that they say there's no therapy. Uh, individuals are allowed to, according to most Islamic scholars, say, okay, I'm not gonna go down to the 10th option of chemotherapy. I would instead like to focus on how can I breathe better? How can I have less pain? How can I be happier? These sorts of things, okay? And again, the focus in palliative care is not making people die any quicker, okay? Which is sometimes a misperception. It's really just, having comfort during that process. Most hospitals in Canada have a chaplain associated either physically there or associated. The chaplains are usually just because of the country we live in, Christian in faith. However, they generally are taught and in my experience will approach things from a non-faith-based uh, perspective, unless you are also Christian and want them to speak about those sorts of things. They'll discuss more spirituality and, and provide support that way. But of course, we also have our local imams and, and leaders that uh, hopefully we can access if we ever needed that sort of support. 
people often ask about using certain medicines in, in palliative, we hear of morphine and other things like that sometimes used. Uh, from the clinical side, it's the intention of the provider, okay, that is most important from an Islamic perspective. If the intention is to treat the pain, it is permissible. And same way as a recipient, that's permissible. If the intention is to uh, have a person die quicker, that is not permissible Islamically. And it's also not permissible receiving it. That's um, pretty unanimously agreed upon. I'll finish off with just a, a couple of slides on medical aid in dying because it's common in the news. It's something you've heard about. There's actually a bill currently in the process of being passed that uh, if you read the news or listen to the news has been discussed quite a bit. Medical aid in dying has been legal in Canada for almost five years now, okay? Um, it's been legal, you can see that, that graph there, that little uh, picture there on the, on the right of your screen. It's been uh, legal or at least decriminalized in other places and countries for many years, including Switzerland, which is probably one of the earliest places. In Canada, for someone to request medical aid in dying, they have to be a Canadian, okay? They have to be an adult and they have to be mentally capable to make the decision. They have to, as of right now, have a grievous and irremediable medical condition. I'll talk about that more in a second. They have to request this voluntarily so I can't be coerced by my uh, spouse, care provider, caregiver, nurse, doctor, anyone should not be coerced, it should be voluntary uh, and there should be informed consent. Uh, meaning you make a decision, you sign it, you wait 10 days, you do it again. Now, I'm sure many of you will see that there can be flaws in this process, but that's the way the process uh, is in Canada at present. When we speak about this grievous and irremediable part of the condition, what it means according to Canadian law is that it's a serious illness, okay? Um, it's The person has to be in an, in an advanced state that cannot be reversed. So as of right now, this is not, uh, I was just diagnosed with, uh, let's say, I'll use pancreatic cancer again. And let's say I have, uh, okay, I'll do a different one. Pancreatic cancer is not the best example. Let's say I have early lung cancer, just got diagnosed. I might still have many, 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 many years ahead of me. It's not a terminal condition with a lot of our therapies and treatments. I would not be eligible under current criteria to request medical aid in dying. Now, if I was on the end stages of condition, the doctors have been, I said, well, I don't have any other therapies for you, then that changes. There has to be unbearable suffering, physical or mental, according to the individual requesting it, okay? Uh, and obviously you can see it's a subjective area, but the individual requesting it. And the natural death has to be reasonably foreseeable. There's a bill currently in process. That's where a lot of this is coming up in the news. If you read the newspaper or, or you watch the news, uh, and you listen to anything other than COVID, then this has been discussed a little bit, uh, that they're trying to take away a couple of the caveats there. So we don't want to say anymore that death has to be foreseeable. So potentially that person with early stage lung cancer could still make a request if this bill goes through fully uh, and it's in the process and looks like it likely will pass. They're also now allowed to say that if I get to a state where I can no longer fill in the blank, let's say no longer communicate, um, open my eyes, shows, whatever it is, then I would like assistance in time. And you can also request this, not right now, but in about a year and a half, if you have just a mental condition, okay, a mental illness. So that might be uh, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, dementia, any one of these. So it's a very, very difficult time. There's a lot of clinicians that are disagreeing with this approach. Uh, including many, uh, probably most Muslim clinicians, because we see some problems with, with this, but uh, most likely this is going to be the law very soon. From an Islamic perspective, this is the one where you probably don't need to speak to any scholar. It's very clear cut, uh, made is not permissible. Uh, it's not something you can request to have your death expedited. Uh, and there's obviously many ayats and other things. I don't think I need to break that down too much, but it's a very uh, unanimous view. So I'll end there. Just we'll do a quick recap and then I'm happy to open it up to questions, comments, or, or clarifications on anything. We spent the first majority of the time talking a bit about advanced care planning because I think it's very, very important. 
We talked a bit about that substitute decision maker SDM hierarchy, right? Where we go spouse or power of attorney number one, then spouse, and then we work our way down. We talked a bit about what does code status mean? And again, everybody getting admitted to a hospital will be asked this question. So it's an important one to understand and have um, your answer to or your approach to. We talked a bit about artificial nutrition and hydration, some of the positives and negatives and different views around are we delaying death or are we prolonging life? And then we talked a bit about um, who, what, when, where, why, and how we want to look at advanced care planning. Okay. From there, we spend a little bit of time talking about palliative care from an Islamic perspective, making it very clear that it is uh, almost uh, unanimously accepted among the uh, Islamic community that this is an acceptable um, type of care at the right stage of life. And the intention of the treatment is very important. And then we just ended the last few slides talking about medical aid and dying, uh, the way the law currently sits and how it will sit very soon. Um, uh, and may not be relevant for, for many people here, but it might be. Obviously, everyone has their own views, but Islamically, it's fairly clear uh, what the perspective is. Uh, but these are things that are kind of common in our, our news and our, our society, so it's, it's important to be aware of them at least. So with that, I'll, I'll stop talking for a little bit and shall I give other people the chance? I'll let uh, Prep uh, uh, Nazmul, you can um, decide if you want people to unmute or, or how you want to coordinate the questions. And I'll let you go from there. I cannot tell from my end whether uh, everyone is hearing me okay, or I'll wait to let the co-host unmute. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. This is uh, Murtaza. If you can help me, doctor. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that insightful presentation. It was very relevant. What you touched upon is what you went through with my late mother. It was very difficult because we had no, no plans. In the offing, she was taken the emergency you know, in the metro, metro moments, and she was there seven weeks, and we had to make some very painstaking decisions. Um, so thank you for touching all those. You know, it brought back a lot of memories. Mm -hmm. However, I think uh, I would advise everybody in the, in the audience to please uh, heed to your advice and make some advanced planning. I know uh, talking about death is kind of difficult, uh, but I think it's something that needs to be done. My mother was elderly, and, you know, for seven weeks, I, I just had to make some very painful decisions. But one question I had for you, doctor, was that can a, can a doctor on staff make a decision for DNR? Like in my mom's case, you know, the doctor made a decision without even talking to me, and my mom should not be resuscitated in the event that she arrested. Uh, and we had a major argument with the doctor and so on. So very good question. Uh, so, um, I'm used to repeating the question, but obviously everyone can hear. So. Uh, the, the doctors, um, there's a couple of things. So number one. Uh, yeah, my degree, just the joint, just the joint quickly. So uh, number one is that uh, the doctor can say, sorry, I'm hearing someone. Sorry, the doctor can say that um, uh, doing CPR is not a reasonable option for this person okay. because of their very advanced condition uh, whether that's medical condition or a combination of age and other things like that, they can say that. Technically, in Ontario, uh, the current law is that they cannot um, uh, decide that for you without your consent. So if they, if let's say, I, I'll use myself as an example, although uh, I wouldn't do this, but let's say I do not think it's appropriate and I cannot get a hold of family, okay? If I cannot get a hold of family, I've made reasonable attempts, I can say, okay, uh, I don't think it's reasonable. Let's say the person is 95 with many, many other medical conditions and it's not, not safe. Then I will um, sometimes uh, say no. And now if the family came back and said, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. They, they should be able to uh, have care because of A, B, C, D. Uh, I am responsible for having a conversation with them. But in the end, I should be respecting their decision. Uh, 
Um, does it always happen that way? No, uh, but technically that's how uh, legally, medically, uh, otherwise in Ontario at the minimum, likely in all of Canada, we are required to do things. Now, there'll be another exception now with COVID, there's a lot of emergency laws being passed because of the, the vast shortage of, potential shortage of, of ventilators. So there will be situations where um, consent will not always be needed. Um, usually those are very clear cut situations where um, uh, that type of therapy is not going to have any meaningful benefit. Uh, but again, the term meaningful is, is different for different people. But hopefully that addresses your question. It should be. I'm going to try to pull up the chat. I think there may be some other questions in there. Thank you. So, you know, we, we had to then uh, get the decision reversed and it was very, very painful. But I, I again, want to thank you for bringing up yeah. all the relevant issues. And I think it's an eye opener for a lot of us. Because so, you're all aging now. So. Any other questions? I think uh, I saw a message from, from one of the organizers. He was, uh, he had some computer trouble. So I'll, I'll just coordinate the questions. If anyone has a question, just feel free to unmute. If you want to write it in the chat, uh, you can do that as well. Dr. Nakhil, I just have another question for regards to the power of attorney. Does it have to be, um, if you just internally decide that, you know, that somebody else, like in my case, you know, I would expect my wife to take over the decision does it still have to be legally authorized? Or? So if, it, if it's your wife, uh, then it's not an issue because she would be number one on the on the list anyway. So even if you've not done any document, uh, you don't have another power of attorney, so it will be her automatically. But let's suppose you wanted it to be uh, your second, let's say you have four children, you want it to be your second daughter because maybe you think she understands your approach better, maybe she has medical background, whatever the reason. If that was the case, and you decided as a family that it's going to be her, she's going to make the decisions, um, that's great. However, if it comes to an actual situation where you can't make decisions, um, and somebody disagrees at that point. So let's say you're, you, you're not able to speak right now, but your uh, eldest son says, no, I don't agree with that daughter, I want to do things differently, then it will be an issue if it's not in writing. But if it's a spouse, it's a non-issue because it would be them regardless. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, feel free to unmute. So uh, I, I have a question. Uh, it's, it's not a question, it's more of a comment because I've experienced uh, something that we had to make decisions on. And one of the things that the doctors would, one of the doctors uh, um, very explaining us, you know, the situation and what, why we should consider moving forward with making this tough decision was that uh, obviously the quality of life wasn't there uh, as well as that we were using up resources that could benefit others. Um, how would you have any comments on that? I mean, you take that into consideration. Thank you. So, so uh, let's talk pre-COVID first. Uh, so, before COVID was a, a major issue, uh, that was not something that was uh, should have been a relevant conversation point anywhere in Canada. We have ample resources, ample supports, ample everything, um, and some clinicians, uh, doctors, nurses, other people. I'm sure do imply that or say it very directly. Uh, that is, uh, does not need to be a factor in your individual decision making, okay? Because technically, um, from a medical legal standpoint, which is which is what everyone goes by, um, you have the right to choose or not choose certain therapies as long as they are uh, reasonable and on the table. So, for example, uh, there are some situations where a therapy may not be an option. So, someone has let's say an infection in their leg, and if they were physically very well, you might do an amputation. Maybe this person is not well enough to undergo the amputation, it would not be offered. Okay. So sometimes certain things are not offered because the person is not well enough. 
uh, before all this stuff that you're hearing about related to COVID and shortages and all of this, um, it was a non-issue in Canada. It's a definite issue in other places where resources are tighter. Um, now, since over the past year or so, you're um, as aware as, as anyone is, I'm sure that there is a lot more pressure on the medical system in terms of beds, numbers, things like that. Um, the worry is that if we, let's for example, say have 10 ICU beds in, let's say have 20 ICU beds in Markham and all of them are filled with people who are have a very low likelihood of ever recovering from there, then when the next person comes in who has a very good chance of recovery if they had a short period in the ICU, they would not have that option. So now, uh, sometimes there is a lot more pressure about um, getting the right level of care for the person's, we'll call it frailty, meaning their combination of medical conditions, abilities, and things like that. I don't know if that addressed your question. I, I, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. That's uh, not how we should be practicing, but I know it does happen. But um, uh, people could potentially be hearing more of that, especially in the past year now. Uh, I mean, just quickly, it was pre-COVID, but uh, the condition was such that it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, like they were saying that regardless uh, that he was using up resources because uh, it wasn't getting better, the quality of was really bad and stuff like that. So yeah. anyway, I like your comment. Thank you. There's a written question I'll, I'll read out and then I'll, I'll try to respond as best I can. Uh, even though palliative care is acceptable from an Islamic point of view, However, a family member decides to go against that route, is it possible? And would the doctors on your wish? So excellent, excellent point. So if I understand the question correctly, they're saying, for example, uh, Ibrahim, uh, we'll use his example because I've been talking about him. Ibrahim is uh, in the, and actually maybe I'll just ask Nesmo, there's a couple of people in the waiting room if you want to just let them in. Sure, but, thank you. Uh, no problem. So let's say Ibrahim uh, says, I want, if this, if this and this happens, I want palliative care. Okay, I don't want life extending treatment. If my cancer gets to this point, just keep me comfortable. No ICU, no, none of this. I don't even want antibiotics. Just keep me comfortable, allow me to pass away uh, in a way that I, I feel appropriate. Uh, he writes it down. He writes a power of attorney, will, uh, advanced care director. He does all the right stuff. If at that time, let's suppose now he comes in, he has a pneumonia, and if his wife says, you know what, I want him to get treatment. And the, the doctor might say, well, he has a written document, it says no. If she insists that no, I think uh, he should get treatment, he should get antibiotics, they will go with what the person is saying at the time. So they will proceed with uh, the antibiotics and ignore that, not ignore, but that will override the palliative request earlier. Okay, I think that was what the person was asking. So the more important than having an advanced care document written is discussing that with the people who are going to be there uh, if you can't make decisions, meaning your spouse and your children if they are, or your close friends or whoever else uh, is in your life. And the reason is uh, your children can still override it. They can still say, yeah, okay, I know he said that, but I think he changed. And the reason they say it is, the reason this is allowed is if I wrote that document six months ago, but then I told you last week I changed my mind, uh, the doctor has no way of knowing that you changed your mind. Okay, you didn't have a chance to see a lawyer, revoke the document, do whatever else. So they will go with um, the most recent request and uh, they will assume that that's, uh, the family member is being reasonable and honest. Now, over time, there could be another family member disagrees and it goes back and forth and there might be some, some back and forth, but more than just doing the documents with a lawyer or whoever else, discuss it with those that are important to you in your life. Hopefully that addresses the question. If not, they can message me back the, the person who did that one. Is the advanced care document uh, normally prepared? Uh, pardon me, say that one again? Is the advanced care document normally prepared by your patients or the people you come across? No, very, very, very few people. I think uh, most, maybe 10% have, have done it. Uh, and it's just because people, nobody likes to think about death or think about their own um, situation. It's a hard conversation to have. Uh, sometimes if you don't know where to turn, usually there are lawyers that will do wills, will do this sort of work as well. Sometimes there's a cost issue. The lawyers will charge a certain amount, but there are many um, even do-it-yourself options that are legally and then they just get notarized at the end, which are much lower costs than going through a lawyer. But um, 
it's a very small percentage that have it done. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we're coming on to three o'clock. Uh, my sincere apologies, my, my iPad froze. Eh? I was telling Dr. Raza Nakui that, you know, this is the only thing that I really worry about, uh, you know, technology letting us down sort of midway through. And yes, it happened. <laughs> anyway, uh, any other questions, uh, last comments or anything? I have one more written one. Uh, it's, I think they're in the process of writing. Okay. We'll give them a minute. Sure. Uh, Dr. Nakui, I just had a quick question for you. Uh, have you had to make a decision where, um, and this is probably a personal question, but uh, where you had to make a decision not to treat a patient because you felt that uh, it will not be beneficial to them, especially in these days of COVID? Yeah, so I'll talk even pre-COVID because post-COVID things are a little bit um, even more that way, but uh, even pre-COVID, there are many times that I would see someone with a condition where um, the family, often, and usually it's the family I'm talking to because if the person's well enough, then it's a very easy conversation. We have it directly with them. It is just not aware of what the likelihood of a good outcome might be from a certain treatment. Uh, and that's a problem with our medical side communicating clearly with the family. Uh, so for example, uh, let's use that same CPR example. I will have sometimes people come in and if I were to ask them very open-endedly, do you want us to do everything to save your dad's life if he became sick? The answer would be yes. Of course, everybody would say yes, or most people would say yes. Uh, but if I explain to them, well, this is what the process actually is. This is the likelihood of them surviving meaningful survival. Uh, this is why I maybe don't recommend it. So a common thing that I will sometimes discourage is a feeding tube, but in very select situations for people with certain medical conditions and other things like that. I would medically discourage the use of a feeding tube because there's not good evidence it works, it causes a lot of harm, there's things like that. So to answer the question, yes. Now, post-COVID, there's uh, definitely a bit more of that conversation, but uh, to be very honest, up until, um, there's just this most recent wave where that's been more of an issue. There was an issue about a year ago when COVID was new and we didn't know what to expect and we were trying to be very uh, careful. And, uh, and then over the past year, Alhamdulillah, we've been blessed that there have not been too many of those sorts of discussions. And now it's starting up a little bit again. Hopefully that addresses uh, the question. I'll read the one that's uh, written here. Thank you. Someone messaged me. Uh, if the patient's elderly, uh, uh, if the patient's elderly, will they allow treatment or would they asked to continue with palliative care. So on the note of that last question that we had, um, so if uh, the, the age generally is not a decision-making factor. Now, practically, sometimes people will use it and say, okay, well, someone who's 95 maybe has uh, different chances than someone who's 65, but uh, practically and medic, well, I say medical legally, because that's what drives some of the direction of conversations. Uh, if somebody is 95 and their uh, spouse, let's say, says, no, no, he doesn't want palliative care um, or I don't want him to get palliative care even now. I want him, to, we want to get back on antibiotics, get back on uh, IV fluids and treatment, then it will still be, they will respect the most recent request from the highest ranking substitute decision maker. Okay, so it's, um, it's a it's a difficult situation, but again, clear conversation with those that you love will, will help make that easier. Um, someone else asked a question, can a relative defy the patient's immediate family? Um, so I'm assuming that means a uh, spouse says, uh, you know, we want to do a palliative approach and the relative says, no, we, we should get, let's say it's a, um, a brother of the loved one says, no, we should get uh, uh, full treatment they will go with what the higher ranking person says. So number one, again, was the power of attorney if it's written. Number two would be spouse. Three would be children and, and so on down that list. So the brother will not have any, uh, uh, any way to dissuade the uh, medical team from what the spouse said. There's a lot of questions about this. So I'll make one little caveat. There's one area where if it is clear to the medical team that the person on this list is not acting in the patient's best interest, so uh, for example, I have a 
very well healthy person come in with a major heart attack, let's say, and it's very clear that they have a very strong chance of recovery, but their spouse is saying no to certain therapies that would otherwise make complete sense. Uh, the medical team is allowed to say that they're, we disagree. There's a whole court, you know, legal process to it, but they can say we disagree. They can go ahead with treatment. There may be legal ramifications later, but it's to try to protect against kind of um, bad intentions, whether it's sometimes it has to do with money and inheritance and things like that. So there is some leeway on that rule, but generally speaking, it's the way I mentioned. That's interesting. <clears throat> okay, it's 3.05. If there are no more questions, we'll bring this to a close. Dr. Nakwe, that's amazing. Um, you gave us a lot of information and uh, something you know to ponder over. So the elderly, the seniors, I guess anybody, everybody should think about that advanced care planning um, or at least within their families, certainly talk about it. Uh, again, I really appreciate you giving up your time you know, on a Sunday afternoon, but you're not playing hockey now anyway, <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> okay, just an announcement for next week. There is no Baraza next week. But the week after, we will have a presentation from him, from an optometrist. Uh, so hope you'll be able to join us. And uh, the notice will be going out uh, uh, in due course. So till then, be safe and be well. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck.